for choosing to watch this televised conversation with His Excellency, the President of the Republic, William Ruto. This is a joint interview with different media houses tiered by NTV, KBC, TV47, K24, and KTN, as well as Citizen TV. My name is Sam Kituku from Citizen TV. And my name is Michelle Ngele Ogiambo from K24 TV. My name is John Jacob Curie of KBC TV. And I'm James Smart from NTV. My name is Ken Mijungu from the Standard Group, KTN. Happy New Year, Linda Alela, TV47, Cape Media. All right, and of course we have the President of the Republic, uh, William Samoy Ruto. Good evening, and first of all, how are you doing this evening? Good evening, uh, good people, and um, thank you very much for introducing me. I would have introduced myself. <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead. And uh, Happy New Year to you guys, and uh, Happy New Year to um, the good people of the Republic of Kenya, wherever you are. Uh, it's my wish that uh, we've all, by God's grace, uh, gro crossed over the year, and we are all beginning this year 2023 20, uh, uh, together, and we are hopeful that uh, this year is definitely going to be better than last. Mm -hmm. And maybe also to use this opportunity, welcoming you guys here, to thank uh, Kenyans across uh, the country for uh, first and foremost uh, for voting for me and all the other leaders that uh, were elected across the political divide in Kenya. Thank you very much. And secondly, uh, for doing two very important things that sets a new record for us as a country. Uh, voting uh, on issues and um, driving our country away from ethnic politics. That was a big score for the people of Kenya. And secondly, carrying out our elections peacefully. I think that was a huge uh, mark of maturity of our democracy. And uh, I want to thank all the people of Kenya who voted in this election, who participated in one way or another. And uh, I want to uh, promise them that um, I will consistently work towards working with all the leaders that have been elected in all the categories mm -hmm. to drive our country into the future. Right, and uh, Mr. President, we want to talk about uh, some five key issues. Uh, first of all, the cost of living and the state of the economy. We'll also speak about education. We'll speak about governance and politics. We'll also speak <coughs> about pre-election pledges. And uh, also we'll speak about security, both locally and internationally. And uh, we thank you for making time to have this conversation with us. Let's get started because at this moment, we rem remember hearing you on the eve of the transition of the year between 2022 and 2023. And you spoke about a conversation the country will have in three months' time about the cost of electricity. We look at how much one has to pay. If you, for instance, you have a bill, you pay 4,000 shillings, and you get your units, about 152 units, you find that 30% uh, is going to fuel energy charge. You also find that uh, the token amount is only 47%, actually less than half the amount that you're paying. And also remember, recently there was a report, a task force by your predecessor that came out and saw that uh, we're paying so much for the cost of energy. Even you, if you have this conversation in three months' time, what will change? Cost of living, um, Sam, is a sum total of many things. It's not just energy, right? It's a combination of, in fact, the biggest contributor to the cost of living is the cost of food. Many households spend up to 52% of their monthly income on food. And therefore, if we seriously want to attack the cost of living uh, jigsaw, we must deal with the cost of food. And it is the reason why cost of living was a big part of the conversation Kenyans had in this election. All of us make, made commitments in many ways. I did. And it's the reason why when I came into office, the very first thing, among the very first things I did is to begin the journey to bring back the country to the, to the, to the, 
to the trajectory of food production. I ordered immediately that we supply 1.5 million bags of uh, for the farmers in the short range uh, category. I have progressed that. We now have uh, the first 200,000 uh, metric tons of fertilizer already landed in the country. We intend, as we have done, we've reduced the cost from about 6,000 to 700. Um, I have also uh, instructed that we work with even the um, uh, uh, land parcels we have within government, ADC, YS, uh, prisons, to make sure that we use them to produce mm -hmm. uh, farm inputs, including uh, seeds and uh, making sure that we are self-sufficient. I have also uh, worked out with the, 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 the cabinet to ensure that since we already have a gap that is uh, obvious because of the kind of harvest we've had, the unreliability of rain, the high cost of inputs, have contributed to where we are, you know? And for your information, Sam, this is a journey. We didn't get here yesterday. Right. We got here because we took three years not making the right decisions. We suspended the, the fertilizer subsidy program. We never intervened when farmers were uh, asking for uh, farm inputs. Today, I am promising the farmers of Kenya just the same way we supplied the first 1.5 million acres, uh, 1.5 million bags of fertilizer, we will supply 6 million bags of subsidized fertilizer to our farmers. We will make sure that they have the correct seed. Mm -hmm. We will ensure that they have the correct support. We are now working on mechanisms. We have a program, Agricultural Finance Corporation, to make sure that we increase our mechani the mechanization of our agriculture. We are currently at around 40%. We want to drive it to 80%. These are some of the interventions that fell through uh, when, when, when we didn't get our trajectory right. Mm -hmm. But what I, as, what I said, speaking to what you have said uh, on, on, on cost of energy, right. there was an attempt, you know, which was not well thought out, to try and introduce subsidies in that space, which failed miserably because we were spending three billion shillings every year to subsidize uh, energy. Uh, there was no increase in consumption of, uh, of uh, electricity. There was no reduction of uh, any pro products that were coming out of uh, our factories. There was no increase of people uh, who were getting employed because we had, we had brought subsidy. It, it was just a waste. Mm -hmm. You know, nobody benefited. The consumers did not benefit. It ended up just lining the bottom line of a few companies and a few, uh, <coughs> a few people. Right. So what I have insisted and what government of Kenya is going to do, we are going to support production of food. We are going to interrogate the cost of energy, right? We have three, four lines, which I have instructed, we're going to spend a billion shillings to sort out three lines of transmission, three transmission lines, so that we can retire the plant we have in Moroni mm -hmm. that is producing energy at 52, shilling, uh, 52 US cents, which, which is, you know, we are getting power from our hydros at four US cents. Can you compare between four US cents and 52? And it's because we have power in Takwell, which, which we are not using maximum because of a transmission line. We have other hydros that we are not using because of trans transmission line. So I have already instructed that we complete those transmission lines within the next 10 months so that we make sure that we bring down the cost of energy because we will retire some of the thermal uh, power that is causing this huge cost. So, right. so what do you do to the, <coughs> the power purchase agreements and the independent power uh, producers? Because according to the task force report, it was talking about the power cost for the financial year 2020, it was 87 billion shillings, which is 66% of the sales. They went ahead to say that, um, yes, uh, the Kenjin was contributing about 72% of the power, but the resources that they were taking is about 48%. For the independent power producers, they are giving Kenya power about 25% of power, but they're taking away about
management of the payments. So how do you deal with that even as you go to the different transmission lines? Precisely. First, the turbine we are retiring in Moroni belongs to government. It is a, Ken it's a Kenyan uh, turbine. So that we will have no conversation. We will just retire that. Then we will have to have a candid discussion with our thermal energy producers. And for your information, we need them. The problem is, for the last five years, we haven't generated much of uh, power. We have uh, uh, megawatts of capped uh, hydro, no, not hydro, but uh, geothermal energy, which I have instructed that we should move with speed to unlock that potential. Because much as we want to retire the thermal power, we have a challenge of the amount of supply of uh, power during the peak hours. So we are juggling between making sure that we use what we have efficiently, mm -hmm. we generate the much more efficient power sources so that we can begin the journey to retire the, the thermal ones. But this requires a consistent, you know, uh, um, uh, approach and, 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 and consistent follow-up. And that's what I intend to do. All right. Your Excellency, going back to the cost of living, Kenya National Bureau of Statistics says inflation rate is now at 9.5, at least by November um, last year. When you come into office, the first thing you do is to remove subsidy on uh, the likes of UNGA. Mm -hmm. now, the big question is, as you run the program on subsidizing the cost of production, mm -hmm. is government saying it was unable to also run the program on subsidizing UNGA so much that you remove the pinch on Kenyans who are feeling the pain as they go to the supermarkets to buy UNGA? John, do you know how much those subsidies were costing us? Mm -hmm. It was costing us 16 billion shillings every year to subsidize fuel. It was costing us uh, 3 billion shillings every, 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 no, no, did I say every year? Every month. Every month. It was costing us 8 billion shillings every month to subsidize UNGA. It was costing us 3 billion shillings to subsidize electricity. A total of 25, 26 billion shillings every month. The decision to subsidize UNGA fuel and electricity was not a com a, a, an economic decision. It was a political decision. It was meant to placate Kenyans to vote in a certain way. Unfortunately, Kenyans did not buy it because they did not feel it. They looked for this UNGA of 100 shillings, they did not buy it. They waited for the price of things to come down, it did not come down, right? because it was a political decision. So, did you, John, expect me seriously to be elected president, and I know what is right, to continue to do what is wrong? What would that do? In a year, we were going to spend 300 billion shillings on subsidy that benefits nobody, you know? It would have been the most reckless thing to do. But uh, just to respond uh, to your issue of inflation, yes, in October, the in inflation went actually not 9.5, it went to 9.6, right? But because of the interventions we have made, inflation is now at 9.1. It's on its way down because we are making the right decisions. It will not be sorted out in a week or two or one month. You know, we got ourselves here because of three years of making the wrong decisions. But I am promising the country that within the next one year, we will have pulled the country from here. We will have set ourselves on the trajectory of making sure that we never again buy UNGA at 240. You know? Thankfully, we have put the brakes on the continued increase of prices of, of unga and all the other uh, food products. At least unga now is averaging around nine, 190 shillings from 230. The price of cooking oil has come down. So we, we are beginning to see the journey to sanity. And it is my intention, not just to promote the production we are doing at the moment, 
but also to make sure that the gap that exists between what the farmers are producing and before the next harvest is that we're going to import maize about and some foodstuffs or about 10 million bags between the month of February and June to make sure that we keep the tabs on uh, the prices of uh, basic food commodities not going up. We are also working full steam. And you saw me yesterday in Galana. Many people believe Galana was a, a, a wrong thing or it failed. Galana did not fail. It was made to fail, right? And I want to promise you, uh, John and your team here and Kenyans, speak to, pre speaking to them directly, that we are going to, to make Galana work. And it's going to work beginning this February. We are going to plant maize in the first 10,000 acres. And we already have the mechanism to do it. In another eight months, we are going to do the next 10,000 acres. <coughs> and in the next two months, three months, I will be in Galana to launch the construction of the dam that will make it possible for the next 300,000 acres. It is possible for us to produce 10 million bags from Galana to seal the gap that we are currently going to import mm -hmm. just by making sure that it works. Mm -hmm. And for your information, it is going to work. And just to show you that S S uh, Galana Gulalu was sabotaged, go to the Ministry of Lands. The fellows who sabotaged it had actually subdivided it into little pieces of land. Who are the president? Who are they, Mr. 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 President? Four acres. Just for clarity. I don't know what, yeah. mm -hmm. you know? Who are they? Who are they? Just for clarity. Let me, let me ask you, do you, do you know uh, the, who, are, who was running the government of Kenya? Yeah. Yes. The so why president. are you asking the obvious? We, we don't know you're the president, you should tell us. And the vice you are, president. And, you are, and you are the deputy <laughs> but president. But you are Kenyans. Yes. You know, when I was shown the door and I was operating from the streets as deputy president, there were people who were running this administration. Mm -hmm. So you see Unfortunately, yes. but for the good news for the people of Kenya, it will not happen. I have canceled the, the, the parceling of that land. I have stopped it and it will not happen because subdividing Galana into two acres, three acres is actually going to send people who are going to require food relief to even live there. When we can actually, uh, uh, let me ask you good people. Galana can feed three, four million Kenyans. Why do you want to go and settle 10,000 people? How will, even if you do math upside down, how? How does 4 million people compare with 10,000? Mr. President, mm -hmm. this, this question obviously asks you, and you've consistently said the subsidies were there to, to line the pockets of a few people. I think it is bestowed on you and to Kenyans to draw a line and say, who are these few people? You said 300 billion a year, for instance, for the last three years. That's 900 billion. Is there responsibility? So what are you saying? I, don't, I didn't understand. Is there responsibility? Are those people who you're blaming them, are they going to take responsibility? Uh, let me, the subsidies were not, did not take three years. The subsidies were introduced. The UNGA one was mm. It failed miserably. So how much money did we lose? Yeah, it, we, we, we didn't lose. We paid people 8 billion shillings. But I don't know. They, they are saying they supplied the maize. <coughs> but nobody saw. The 100 uh, shilling, uh, the 100 shilling maize, mm -hmm. right? If you ask Kenya Power, they was they are supposed to have been paid 26 billion. I asked the MD of Kenya Power. So how much money uh, were you were you paid apart from the money that Treasury gave, which is four billion shillings, and it was given uh, in uh, July? No other money was given to them. So what did Kenya Power do? It just went into debt. So you are financing a subsidy using debt. What kind of logic is that? Mr. President, that is injustice, that is impunity, that is corruption. What then will your government do to make sure that they get to the bottom of this? Or do we just let it go? Let me uh, tell you, because uh, nobody, nobody like, like for example, the, 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 the UNGA subsidy. When I came into office as audit, you know, I think already four billion shillings had been paid. Mm -hmm. I said, before we pay the next four billion, we have to audit. 
So you're telling us you supplied this maize. Who to? Where was it supplied? You know? That's number one. Number two, when I asked Kenya Power whether they were paid this 26 billion, nobody paid them. So what did they do? They didn't charge the customers, so they went into more debt. That's why today I have to look for money to get Kenya Power out of, uh, out of, out of the mess that, was put, uh, that they were put in by, by, uh, by, by, by subsidies. So these are political decisions that are made for political expediency, you know? I am not here to make political decisions because we cannot get, get Kenya where we all want. We have to make some of the difficult decisions. Many people uh, are wondering, why did I cancel the subsidies? It looks nice to talk about subsidies, but you know, you have to interrogate. Is it correct, popular, but is it right? It is not right. Mr. President, what do you tell a Kenyan who is watching you tonight? feeling the pinch of that pain mm. and knowing that there was subsidy mm. before and they cannot afford that unga now, what do you tell them? How long do they have to wait? My good friend, even with the subsidy, how many Kenyans got their 100 uh, shilling uh, unga? How many? You know, nothing really changed for, for millions of Kenyans. So it is not correct for you to say they were having subsidy help them to get anything. Subsidy helped a few people. It never helped the consumer. Okay. Right, but the cost of living... The, the, the most important thing that has happened is that I have stopped the hemorrhage of public funds. Yeah? We are not going to go into more debt. And I, let me tell you, good people, the one thing that I had to do, which was the most important thing to do, is to put the brakes tight for debt. And even what we had agreed, or what the former government had agreed with the World Bank, to borrow an extra 900 billion to cover the gap that existed in the budget, I have come, interrogated the 900 billion, and said, please, good people, we are going to net off 300 billion. We are actually going to borrow 300 billion less because it is the right thing to do. We cannot continue to run our economy on the foundation of debt. We are going to bankrupt this country. What happens to and, the deficit? And, and, and that is why I have, in the, you will see in the supplementary budget, we have cut down by 300 billion, the borrowing. And what have I done? I have started the trajectory to build our own revenue. You know, three things. Everybody's going to pay debt. It's going to pay uh, tax, mm. right? Starting with William Ruth. Everybody's going to pay, is going to pay tax. There will be no waiver for nobody, right? You saw people waiving, you know, the, the taxes mm. for their businesses, you know? You buy this bank, you sell that bank, you waive taxes, you, you know? It's not going to happen under my administration. Everybody's going to pay debt. And number three... Who did that for the record? You know, number three, you go find out. Mm. Number three, we are installing a, a, a new tax system because at the moment we've been collecting 60% of VAT, for example, collectible VAT, almost 40% we are not collecting because it goes here, it pilgrimages there, it goes this way. The system we are now installing is going to drive the collection of VAT to between 90 and 97%. A follow up on that. That because should be able to collect an extra two to 300 billion. In fact, the target I have given to KRA is that by June this year, we should be able to collect an extra 500 billion by June this year. How is that going to happen, Mr. President? Because when it comes to increasing the tax base and cutting spending on borrowing, then the country's business environment must be different. Something must change in the country's business environment. What are the administration's plans to improve the ease of doing business, which essentially will see a broadening of the country's tax base? Precisely, that's what I'm telling you, uh, my good sister Linda. 
I am telling you, Michelle, sorry, Michelle. That's why I'm telling you, everybody first must pay tax. Yeah, let's begin there. This is not the animal farm where some animals are more equal than others. This is Kenya. We are all equal. Everybody pays their, their, their portion of the, of, the, of the tax. And number two, we are going to make sure that more people come into the space where they work with government to pay tax. What am I doing about that? We are going to, ta uh, we are going to digitize all government services in the next six months. Yeah? E-Citizen, which we had started in, uh, which, which, which was, uh, we, we had started, ran into headwinds, and nobody wanted to sort it out. <coughs> I came in, I called the E-Citizen guys, we have sorted out the E-Citizen uh, shenanigans, and in the next six months, every government service will be available <coughs> online, digitally. And with it, every government service where tax is payable is going to be collectible online. I am not going to wait for anybody to say, okay, I will file a return at the end of the month. There will be nothing like that. We will be paying tax as we, as we, as we, as we spend our money mm -hmm. or as we, <coughs> as, we do, as we do our business. That way, I can be able to broaden the tax base I can be able to seal <coughs> the leakages in the, in, the, in, the, in the whole system. And watch this space. Yes. I intend to collect an extra trillion shillings in the next 24 months and double our current collection by 2027 to make sure that we begin to drive the country from the cliff of debt back to sanity. And, and that's how we're going to take this forward. Mr. President, now that you have engaged us on public debt, I have two questions. The first, two questions. The first question is, out of our collection currently, about 65% goes to the payment of debt. Now, the dollar, when the shilling falls, that also increases our debt by about 30 billion shillings. Mm -hmm. What is your plan to ensure you get us out of this public debt crisis? One bullet. We collect every collectible revenue in Kenya, and everybody pays their piece, right? Mm -hmm. uh, how will we sort this out? I have told you. I have given you my because there is no there is no miracle required. There is no magic required. It's just basic numbers, and it's not even difficult numbers of algorithm and what have you. It's just plus and minus. Right? We are collecting two trillion. We are spending 1.4 trillion to pay debt. We are remaining with how much? 600 million, right? Mm -hmm. Our salaries alone is 700, million, uh, 700 billion Kenyan shillings. So we have to borrow money to give to the counties. We have to borrow money to do operation and maintenance. We have to borrow. It cannot work like that, my friend. So what do we have to do? Yes. We need to make our numbers add or add up. So first thing, we drive our revenue yeah, to make sure that and cut down on our spending. So I am doing two things. <coughs> I am cutting down on our spending. Yeah, the, it was projected that it, our deficit would be 6 points. I have forced it to come to 5.8. Mm -hmm. Next year, my projection with my team is that we want to, to bring the fiscal deficit to 4.4% so that we progressively reduce debt, progressively push our own resources mm -hmm. and use our own resources to run our own uh, our, 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 our development. Because if we continue in this trajectory, uh, Ken, you know, if we continued in this trajectory of borrowing money left, right, and center, we will drive the country into bankruptcy. Your country, Mr. President, is classified by IMF as a, a high-risk debt distressed country together with the countries like Ghana, Malawi, Zambia and the rest. Now I'll give you an example of just two countries, the uh, GDP um, per capita. For Ghana is 2,445.29 US dollars. For Kenya is a little lower with about 400, <coughs> which is about 2,006 US dollars. Now my question is, Ghana has defaulted. 
do you see your country, Kenya, defaulting? And if your country, I'll just give a context, if your country, Kenya, defaults, what will we do? Increasingly, your government has been seen to be facing the West more than the East. You'll have to go renegotiate with China. Now, if this happens, what is your plan? Because Ghana has defaulted, we are categorized in the same frame. First, Ken, uh, you're telling me your country. So, which is your country? I thought this, it was our country. <laughs> you're in charge. <laughs> I'm in charge, but it's our country. In charge. <laughs> it is our country. Yes. So, this country of ours, <laughs> which you and me have equal stakes, right? Uh, we only have different jobs. Will not default. That one I want to give you. Uh, my we are not in that position that we are going to default as a country. We will not. And the people of Kenya can be assured that our country will not default on our obligations. That is number one. And the reason why we will not default is because we have already applied brakes on any more borrowing. Our borrowing is going to be limited to only what we must borrow, yeah. right? <clears throat> uh, uh, number two is because we are beginning the journey to grow our own savings and to grow our own revenues. Yeah, by making sure that we have a plan on how to expand our tax base, by making sure that we digitize all government services and bring everybody into the net who is, who is supposed to pay to pay, making sure that the tax system is also friendly, making sure that our plan on saving is accelerated, as you have seen, if you have a loan, saved in one month 600, uh, 600 million Kenyan shillings. Once we, we scale up, you will, you will see the kind of saving that we're going to do. Once we, uh, we are finished with uh, NSSF and, and all the other uh, savings, and we, we, are, we, are, we, are, we are getting more Kenyans to do business, we will, we will be in a position to expand our tax base. Okay. Apart from the personal loans we are giving on Hustler Fund, scale it up to the, to the loans, uh, to the circles, to the chamas, to the other categories, and make sure that more people are engaged in enterprise. Okay. And to ensure that we expand our tax base, we grow our revenues, and we finance our development not by debt, not by uh, borrowing, but by making sure that we use our own resources. And finally, on the issue of uh, uh, re re uh, facing west, east, south, you know, we have the uh, choosing friends. This is not a, 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 a this versus that, you know? The more friends you have, it's like you have more assets. The more enemies you have, it's like you have more liabilities, you know? Who tells you we cannot be friends with China and be friends with America? Why? China and America are doing business. Who are, who are we <laughs> not, not to do business with everybody? You know? So you, you, you should be able to separate politics, you know, disagreement, you know, political positions with interests. We have interests as a nation. And if our interests with China, we work with China. If our interests dictate that we must work with uh, the West, we work with the West. You know, it is a mutually beneficial relationship. Okay. Yeah. I am very happy that we have a good relationship with the East. I am also very happy that we are now developing a good relationship with the West. Mr. Okay. President, would you look at that camera and admit to Kenyans that SGR was a haste? Mombasa, Nairobi was a haste. What do you mean was a haste? It's been now documented that it was theft of public funds, funding that SGR. No, I, I, I cannot, you know, you, I, can, I cannot say what is not absolutely factual, you know. We developed the SGR. The only problem that SGR ran into is it ran into capture by a few people. 
so that it didn't, it, it was not allowed to do what it was supposed to do, right? So we, we, we are, and, and by the way, <coughs> it is in my plan to make sure that SGR pays for itself okay. because it is possible. M Mr. President, um, you mentioned something because you're now focusing on the pre-election pledges that you've been implementing and you started with the Hustler Fund and I listened to you in the Swahili episode and you spoke about some 20 billion shillings has been borrowed so far. The figures we have from the ministry so far as of today are 12.8 I don't know how you account for that difference, but also secondly, <laughs> um, we know that um, the regulations that were prepared by the National Tre Treasury and approved by Parliament uh, say that, uh, yes, money shall be appropriated uh, by the House, but also there shall be a board to manage it, there shall be a secretariat to manage it. Who is managing the Hustlers Fund today? On the figures, I have so many figures, you know, by virtue of my position, I deal with quite a host of figures. You are correct that the amount that we have lent is not 21 billion, it is 12.9 billion as of this evening, right? I went and checked the numbers because uh, my minister actually sent me a text and said, this is uh, the 21, uh, the 21 I, I mentioned were the number of transactions. It's actually 21 million transactions that have taken place. All the other numbers are right uh, that, I, that I mentioned. So there is no discrepancy between my numbers and the others. Let's leave that there. Mm -hmm. uh, your other question was on who is managing, who is managing the Hustler mm -hmm. Fund. We, uh, I decided that uh, we are going to use the benefit of technology to run this fund. And that is why this fund is successful. If we had gone the route of forming a committee in every village and a committee in every constituency and another committee in every... First, we would not even have formed the committees. Forget about disbursing the money, right? I mean, <coughs> technology works, my friend. Which is I mean, true. So what we have done is we have engineered. We already have the KNEST, which is approved by the... Uh, RBA to manage the component of savings, you know, which is, which is already which is already in place. We have a board, yeah, that originally was part of KNEST, which is now the board we are adopting to run the the Hustler Fund, and the Secretariat is actually a, a consortium that we established between the government and our national mobile operators. But, but Mr. And President. we have a complete secretariat, including even a call center okay. that makes sure that citizens can... And, and, and that uh, is good, it. Mr. President. Allow me to interject you. Um, but regulations of your own government say yes. that a board shall be constituted. Mm -hmm. In fact, the board has to be appointed by you, the mm -hmm. president. Yes. The secretariat shall be appointed. The administrator will be appointed by that board. Mm -hmm. Now, you're using the board of Keynes. How do you explain... Keynes, actually, the Hustler Fund is a product of Keynes. You know, that's, that's how we developed it, you know. And you see, uh, Sam, while I agree with you that processes are very good and we should do processes, but I think, I think results are better. You know, is the Hustler Fund working? Have we dispersed money? Are real Kenyans, are real Kenyans today beneficiaries, is that agenda moving forward? That, that the process are important, the results are also much more important. My, uh, my submission to the people of Kenya is that for the first time, we have a product that doesn't require layers and layers and layers of bureaucracy, but a product that is working. The fact that a Kenyan somewhere <coughs> You know, he doesn't know William Ruto. He may not even know his MCA. He may not even be known by the Mze Wamita. But on his phone, somehow, he has gotten a government service and he has received 2,000 shillings and he is running his show. I think that's the best news ever.
Mr. President, it shouldn't that be the bold reason? Hustler Fund is such a far-reaching economic revolution, using your words. Shouldn't that be the bold reason why it should be anchored in law, so that it's not, as you say, a William Ruto product? Let me tell you, uh, my, good, uh, my good brother, Mr. Smart. Hustler Fund is anchored in law. Yeah? Uh, as I answered earlier, all the resources that are being used in Asla Fund are public resources. We went through the public participation processes, we went through Parliament, we have established it, we went all the way to getting the license from the RBA uh, to en ensure that uh, we, we are in compliance with the law and to make sure that every requirement of law has been satisfied before we apply uh, public, uh, public resources. And I want to give you my assurance that the success of the Hustler Fund is the benefit we gain from digitization and technology. I was very impressed when our uh, mobile operators were so patriotic that they were willing to be part of this product, even if it, to some extent, undermined some of their own products. But they saw the national good. They say, yes, we are making money here. But if we can have a government-sponsored program that reduces the interest rate from 300% to 8%, from 1% per day, to 0.02% per day, let us support this. Program. But how inclusive is the program, Mr. President, with the digitization and technology? We're speaking of more than 40 million Kenyans. In the first week of the Hustler Fund, more than 50% of those who borrowed were from Nairobi County. How inclusive um, nationally is the Hustler Fund? For your information, your statistics are not right. Mm. You should look at the current spread of Hustler Fund. It is national. In fact, every county, the, 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 the variation is actually in, it is only on population. The population of a county, the more the people who are borrowed. The smaller the population of a county, it is just commensurate. Hmm. And f again, for your, for your information, even though you may think that uh, maybe there are some people, because of technology, they cannot be reached, uh, Michel you will be very surprised because you can access Hustler Fund even on Mulikamwezi, you know? So, so long as you have a Mulikamwezi, you are in business. And you don't have to know nobody. You don't have to know anybody. You, even your neighbor is not important. But there are only the committee, the, as I said, the committee is three people, is three. Yourself, your phone, and technology. Finish. In case, because technology fails, Mr. Mm -hmm. President, mm -hmm. in case Hustler Fund, two years to come, Bales, and there's something that goes wrong. <laughs> Who takes responsibility? William Ruto takes responsibility. Okay. Okay. Beyond Mr. that, Mr. Break, President. Before we yeah. take a break, okay. because there, the there are Kenyans stops, watching you tonight. The back okay. okay. Pese Awaze, Mr. President, a yes. very minute, because there are people who are asking. Hmm. Pese Awaze, Kwame. Pese Awaze is on. You know, contrary to stories being peddled around, you know, the, the challenges that we have faced with Pese Awaze, the challenges we have faced with all the things that we are doing, is because we do not have adequate public <coughs> resources. You know, the roads stalled one and a half years ago because there was no money to pay for them. The, 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 you know, we must just appreciate that our economy was not doing well and somebody needed to come and bring back our economy. And that's exactly what I am doing. And I want to promise the people of Kenya I will sort out this economy and make sure Mr. that it serves sure. us for now yeah. and for the future. We need to take a short break, but uh, the Kenyans are asking that uh, as we're taking a break from the Swahili episode, you are not wearing a ring. Now you have one. Sam, <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> um, you, you, you are the only person who is also wearing a ring here. This one it has no ring. This one has uh, Unfortunately, uh, information. Uh, wait, wait, what's the ring? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, the, you know, I saw that, eh? you know, in a hurry to come here, you know, these characters, I was having uh, some meetings in the office, and then they came and told me, go dress up, you know. The, so in the process of all that, 
I, I forgot my ring. And uh, it's very interesting. It became a subject of discussion. I thought we were having a very serious conversation here <laughs> about it. <laughs> but anyway, <laughs> let me tell you the story of the ring <coughs> now that you have asked. Yes. You know, when Rachel and I uh, got married, we went to that fellow called Nagin Patni, I think it's all. Yes. There, up on River Road. So we bought rings there. <laughs> so it was then 700 shillings. So, of course, it got tired along the way. So, Kika <laughs> Bunjika. So, it took so long to go and uh, get a replacement. Mm. So, when she got a replacement, oh, no. a replacement for no, you. Uh, yeah, of course, <laughs> she goes and she's there. <laughs> well, I, I thought it's when who buy the ring. But anyway, we take a short break here. We're speaking to President William Ruto. Um, on this day, the very first uh, conversation since he became president, we'll be back shortly with more topics. Mm. And Mr. President, thank you uh, for staying with us. You didn't leave us. Uh, <laughs> it's a good thing for a host. Uh, but um, let's talk about the, a very important conversation, that is education. On 23rd of January, Kenyans are supposed to take back their children, those who are parents, back to school. What do you think? Um, because junior secondary, grade 7, reports back to their primary schools. When you're thinking about this, what do you envision will be this sort of uh, conversation and activities in that school where you have now primary schools, kids um, or children, between grade one and six, you have a junior secondary learner, you also have a standard eight learner, yet the teachers, yes, there's a process to employ, but so far no one is ready uh, to teach that grade seven as of now. First, I'll give you the background. Uh, as, as I said earlier, you know, education is one of the most precious things that any nation, you know, anywhere, um, uh, places a premium on. Uh, and, and it is especially for Kenya, because the biggest resource that we have as a country is our human capital. Today, our human capital earns us more money than all the, 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 the other tea, coffee, our remittances from Kenyans who work 
400 billion plus every year. So, so it tells you the importance of our human capital, number one. Number two, as you've said correctly, every parent, myself included, you think about the education of your child. And therefore, it's a very emotional, it's a very important issue. So um, the change, the transition to CBC, from where I sit, is the correct transition. There, there could have been some missteps. Maybe it was, uh, uh, maybe we should have taken an extra one or two years to make sure that we get the teachers on board, all the other uh, facilities on board, but that's now water under the bridge. That's why it was also a conversation in this election. And I took the decision that for us to get professional advice, let us put together a presidential working party of educationists and other stakeholders. And they have done a good job. They've talked to, uh, they've talked to uh, teachers, they've talked to parents, they've talked to other stakeholders, people who run schools and, and everybody else, and it was unanimous. 86% of 20,000 people that were uh, engaged said they wanted the junior secondary to be a, near the parents because many of these uh, children are still young. Their, ch their, their parents need to look, uh, to look after them to make sure that they are fine. And also it reduces on the cost of education. You know, if you have to take your child to a school, you know, far away, maybe in a boarding school, it costs more. So I think the unanimous decision was made and I, and I believe that that is the correct uh, decision. We also agreed that that transition is going to happen uh, for all our children, you know, that, that uh, are in grade six, they will all transit to, because we still insist on the 100% transition. Mm -hmm. They will move to junior secondary. And as government, we took the decision that we are going to hire an extra 30,000 teachers, the largest ever, uh, to make sure that that transition is not only smooth. And next year, we're going to hire another 30,000 teachers, just because of budgetary reasons, to make sure that our education is seamless. Um, that uh, presidential working party, I also tasked them, not just to look at CBC, but to look at our Tibet institutions, to look at our university institutions, the whole education sector, because that is the sector that makes Kenya what it is, right? So apart from the uh, transition and the CBC, uh, the which has been my pet project, and I pushed it ever since I was Minister for Higher Education, slowed down the last four years because of politics, you know? But now, we're going to hire another 2,000 tutors uh, uh, this January to make sure that we are up to date with the skills mm -hmm. and competencies that are being taught in our Tibet institutions, especially those focusing on engineering, because that's the direction we are going. All right, before we get and to Tibet, Mr. President, let me take you back uh, to the uh, Presidential Working Party on Education Reform. They are uh, recommending that grade seven, eight, and nine be domiciled within the primary school setup. Now, you mentioned the Teacher Service Commission has advertised 30,000 positions, and these include interns and those permanent um, and pensionable as well. But does this address the gap? Because this would mean then that we need more teachers to address the gap within primary school that we may need to address the transition to secondary schools. Do these 30,000 teachers fit to address this transition to both primary and secondary schools? Absolutely. In fact, the Teacher Service Commission are the professionals. We, we give them the latitude to decide how many of the teachers will help in the transition to junior secondary, how many of the teachers will assist in the continuing uh, secondary education, and how many of them will go, to, uh, will, go to, will go to primary. So that is the decision of professionals and it is the, the, the expertise that we have in the Teacher Service Commission is able to tell us where the numbers are. Of course, we could do with a lot more teachers and that is why I'm saying phase one, we're going to hire 30,000. Next year, we're going to hire And progressively, as we committed ourselves in our manifesto, by year five, we will have hired 
110,000 additional teachers. A very important transition. To make sure that uh, that whole transition metrics goes on. Mr. President, a very important pr uh, transition beat for the class seven. And of course, the report on ground is that when the uh, government will be hiring teachers, like one teacher for every class seven class, uh, you know, class, of course, this is a big transition. How then will they manage 14 subjects for these very students, understanding very well that specialization angle? Of course, you know, the resources will be shared you know, uh, between the secondary schools that exist at the moment, we are also going to work with, we have teachers who have already uh, graduated to degree level who are teaching in the primary. Mm -hmm. We are going to uh, uh, identify those teachers to come and support the junior secondary transition. Mm -hmm. So the, we have sat down for long hours with TSC. They have mapped out how many teachers are diploma teachers who are teaching in primary? How many are graduate teachers who are teaching in primary who can now support the junior secondary? How many can we transition this way, that way? And how many, what can we do to make sure that we leverage on the employment that's going to happen next year? So all that is mapped out because it is important for us to provide a transition for all our children and ground our education properly. And as I speak to that point, allow me just to speak about our university education. Part of what we have informed the Presidential Working Party on education reform is to make sure that they give us the correct recommendation because our position is that we should be able to, sort to um, create a merger between the Tibet funding uh, board, the university funding, uh, funding board, the higher education loans board, because all these boards are putting students in this university. They are putting students in that college. This one is organizing bursary and nobody is talking to nobody. We need a system that ensures that we are taking so many students to college X. That's why we are giving them so much money. And that's why we are allocating so much bursary so that our education is grounded on sound economics. As we talk now, most of our universities are bankrupt. Egerton University, one of our universities, the CEO has been taken to court, is almost in jail. You know, and the reason is we are giving between 52 and 55% of the requirements of our universities. It is time we sat down and uh, um, assigned all our universities, the students that we have the capacity to fund and to give bursary. Right. Still on junior secondary. Otherwise, if we continue this way, we are going to lower the education of our universities and it's going to affect our human capital development. Okay. And that we don't want to do. Still on junior secondary, Mr. President, what should parents expect in supporting their students in junior secondary? As we speak right now, we have parents across the country who are in limbo because their schools, their children are in, do not have facilities, adequate facilities for them to transition to grade seven. Now these parents will be staring at perhaps transferring their children to different schools, which again is a cost they did not anticipate. How will the government work about this to ensure that every child remains in school? Michelle, I don't think parent will be advised to transfer their children to the next, to any other school. Because number one, we do not have a shortage of classrooms. Yeah, we have, in every primary school, we have an extra classroom for grade seven to go to. That's number one. We are sorting out the teachers. We are sorting out the curriculum. That's all in place. The only thing that is going to be pending, and we intend to have a conversation with our members of parliament, is to build for them within one year a laboratory. Yeah? In fact, it is possible to convert some of the extra classrooms that were uh, already built into laboratories. Mm. In, and it is possible for uh, schools that share the same compound, the secondary schools, for the grade seven to carry out their uh, laboratory work in the secondary school. So we have all manner of permutations to make sure that we sort out this transition. I am not saying it is going to be, I'm not saying it's an easy thing, but I want to promise you it's doable. You know, we have all hands on deck. Mm -hmm. You know, everybody is working seamlessly. And I want to thank members of parliament. They are very keen to support this transition 
with their allocation of CDF. Mr. Transition to the next topic. Uh, on that education matter, you are talking about bringing together the university fund, TVET fund, and HELB. Mm -hmm. According to the current um, budget, the university fund has been allocated 91.2 billion shillings, uh, or rather university education, sorry, HELB 15.8 billion shillings, TVET capitation 5.2 billion shillings. And I'm just wondering, even if you put the body that is financing students together with the body that is financing these institutions, at the end of the day, it's a question of resources. So how does that resolve if your government cannot allocate revenue? Already, mm -hmm. we, 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 we are pushing the resources that are available for uh, uh, loans board, you know, to 21 billion. Yeah, that, that, that will be reflected uh, shortly. We are also uh, working with the university, and that's why I made it a subject of the Presidential Working Party, mm -hmm. because we need some candid talk and firm decisions on how many, sh how many students should we admit, yeah? How many students can we fund? And how much money can the bursary we have, how, much, how many students can the bursary we have support? You know, so that we don't send students to a college or a university, and there is no com commensurate financing to support their education. You know, it is just basic logic. So this is the conversation that we need to have. And in my opinion, it should be possible as you place a student, you must also know, is there funding for the education of that child? And is there supporting bursary to make sure that that child uh, finishes that. But we have situations, Mr. President, where universities like Mount Kenya University will have more students in the School of Medicine than the University of Nairobi. What's your take on help supporting students in private universities more than those in public universities? That's the conversation we're going to have. Ultimately, Mr. President. That's the conversation we are going to have because okay. uh, we need to interrogate, you know, how feasible is it for government to support so many students with little money instead of supporting the number of students that they can with adequate resources to make sure that they, correct, they get the correct training. Mm -hmm. So that's the conversation we're going to have. Mm -hmm. And we're going to have it with mm -hmm. public universities and we're going to have that conversation even with the private universities. And possibly we could, where we are not able to finance, uh, we have to be honest with ourselves. Let me give you a, 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 a practical situation there, Michelle. We have students in uh, academies. They pay 100,000, 200,000 a term, right? All through, from standard one to form four. But when they go to university, we want to tell them we can pay for all of them. Why? If a parent is able to pay for their child in primary and in secondary, why don't we allow them to pay for their child in, in university? So that we support the children of the people who cannot afford. Why, for example, mm -hmm. would my daughter or son of William Ruto be given uh, a bursary in, in, the, in the university when William Ruto can afford? Mm -hmm. Or for that matter, Ken Michungu here? Or James Matt? Mm -hmm. You know, I'm sure, I'm sure that you guys can. So we really have to be honest. Allow for me to ask this question. <laughs> so we really have to be <laughs> honest <laughs> with that. And I'm, I'm sorry. If I, no, that, that, that's it, an interesting conversation. We really, have to, we really have to be honest with ourselves right. that let those who can afford mm -hmm. pay. Okay. We're positive let those who this cannot right. afford, let us think of how do we support them, mm -hmm. rather than pretending that we are able to support all the children, mm -hmm. even, 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 even when we are not the position to. Last Mr. President, can uh, <laughs> allow me to come first? Okay. Are you telling me Michungo wewe uwezo kulipia mtoto wako kwa university? Well, so hii mtoto wako wako kwa nini? Kwa academy alafu unasema nini? All right. Okay, uh, Mr. President, we are positive on getting it uh, right. Yes. Ultimately, it's about making sure that we have students that are well baked for the job market. Absolutely. For, you know, the world out there. We have lots of skills today. We have lots of experience, but not fully utilized. What are you doing to make sure that then, after all said and done, these skills, this experience, will be utilized for economic growth? Three things. 
Number one, we have to drive our industrialization and manufacturing value addition agro-processing agenda. It is a big part of our plan. And that is why I have set the Ministry for Investment, Industry, and uh, 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 manufacturing, you know, the <coughs> <coughs> Ministry of Investment, Trade, and Industry. Because, and I have put there an investment banker called uh, Moses. Uh, Moses Kuria. Mm -hmm. uh, Moses Kuria, when he's not a politician, is a very serious professional. Oh, yeah. Right? And I have confidence that him and his team of PSS, I have given him three PSS, very serious people, they will deliver on that agenda. We want to reverse the slide back in our manufacturing. You know, our manufacturing has gone down as a percentage of G GDP from 9% to 7%. We have agreed with the ministry, we have agreed with the Kenya Association of Manufacturers, we have agreed with KEPSA, we have agreed with everybody that we are going to do a 20 by 30. We are saying by 2030, manufacturing should be contributing 20% to our GDP. That's the plan we have. That's how we are going to create the jobs. Uh, you, you are, you're saying that we have so many skills. That is why I have also moved forward the completion of the Dongokundu, for example, a special economic zone where we are estimating to hire maybe 30, 40, 50,000 people. From being completed in 2028, I have pushed our development partners, uh, JICA and all that group, to make sure that it is ready by 2025. That is why I am pushing the industrial city in Naivasha. Already, we are working with our textile industries, we are working with our uh, leather, in, leather, leather product uh, industry. You may want to know, uh, Lydia, <coughs> that we are wasting close to 50% of all our hides and skins being eaten by dogs, being be, uh, buried. When we are buying shoes, we are buying leather products that we should be producing using our own labor, using our own... Uh, raw material from our own uh, an animals, we slaughter three million mm -hmm. livestock every year. We are the third largest livestock holder as a country in Africa. We should be able to take advantage of okay. the raw material that we have, run our industries and make sure. And I have given KPIs, and that is the conversation, by the way, mm -hmm. we are going now to uh, uh, synchronize tomorrow. With, 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 with my cabinet. Okay. We're going to have three days of sitting down on how to deliver on the plan, ministry by ministry, priority by priority, with the timelines, with costs, to make sure that we don't disappoint uh, the people of Kenya. And finally, I have told you about diaspora, for example. Right. You know, that is a resource that we can use. Kenyans are outstanding. Everywhere they go, whether it is in the um, tourism industry, whether it is in the hospitality industry, whether it is in whatever other industry, they stand out globally. That's why I'm saying we have a resource. You know, Mr. I intend, uh, just one minute, uh, Sam. I, I intend uh -huh. to drive the agenda to make sure that we leverage the many Kenyans who have skills, as Linda has said, we get them working everywhere in the world. That's why I've set up the Pora, and I have put their peers, and I have told her she has no other business. She must get Kenyans working everywhere, okay. and every Kenyan who is working everywhere must be serviced by the government of Kenya. I intend to raise, by God's grace, the 400 billion to a trillion. Mm -hmm. Then we will be talking business. Mm -hmm. So we will be creating jobs locally, and we will be driving our jobs agenda internationally. Okay, Mr. President, let's make progress and talk about the uh, security situation in the country. And recently we had some sentiments from the new Inspector General that you appointed. He was talking about um, uh, the police and defending themselves. We also had the Deputy President, Rigabi Gashagwa, saying that uh, the police must protect themselves, do not provoke them. And this is coming at a time that it's just over 100 days that you said 
uh, that there will be no extrajudicial killings in this country. So when IPOA comes and complains, then they're called busybodies by officers that you've appointed. Wh how do you explain that? And what is the agenda of the government moving forward to ensure that there will be no such kind of um, activities? Let me repeat, for the avoidance of doubt, there will be no extrajudicial killings in the government of Kenya under my administration. Yeah, that is a, chap a chapter we must close and weld and bolt and put it behind us. Uh, the police, I have sat down with the command of the police from the IG downwards, and we have agreed that they will operate within the law. Within, operating within the law includes defending themselves. Yeah? They are licensed to use firearms to deal with criminals, but to also defend themselves. Because if they don't defend themselves, they won't even be there to sort out uh, the criminals. So let us not, uh, I don't think the deputy president or indeed the IG said that they want to continue with extrajudicial killing. That is not our policy. And we are all aligned as government. Um, I have, uh, as an administration, I have said we are going to respect and we are going to work with all institutions that make sure that government works in a manner in which that's supposed to work, respecting the rule of law constitutionally. So the uh, independent police oversight authority has our support. We are going to fund them. We are going to support them. And already, I have uh, told them that they must begin to give us a program on the investigation of how we ended up with close to 200 Kenyans being killed and dumped in rivers. Mm -hmm. They must come. They must come to the country and tell us, right? And so whenever you find this institution maybe uh, saying something contrary with another institution, that's the beauty of democracy. That is the system of checks and balances. That's why the opposition, sometimes they don't agree with me or they don't agree with government. But that does not mean that we have war, you know? It is, the, the, it is how the system is meant to work. Every institution is supposed to check the other institution. Mr. President. And to make sure that everybody has a constitutional mandate. Everybody must operate within their constitution. If the constitutional mandate of IPOA is to make sure that there are no excesses in the police, that is their duty, and they must carry out that duty. Mr. President, I'm here wondering, you have been a subject of harassment by police officers, and some of your allies too, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and police officers claimed they were following or <laughs> operating within the law. <laughs> when you say that they, in defending themselves, they're <laughs> operating within the law, <laughs> it appears like there's a way police understand the law and how Kenyans understand it. You is, <laughs> give a clearer direction when you say that they, are, they can defend themselves within the law, because sometimes operating within the law has different meanings. The police not can. They must defend themselves. That's the law, you know? They, they must defend themselves. They, 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 they cannot put themselves at risk, you know, and be able to continue being a police force that helps us sort out our security. But, yes. I have been a subject of harassment by the police. But you heard me. I spoke clearly with clarity. And I told the IG and all the commanders who came here from every county that they have no business carrying out political orders. Let them go and read the Constitution and read the law. You know? And I have told them there is no government person or opposition person. We are all taxpayers. They must protect all Kenyans the way they protect the president. Yeah? Whether they voted for the opposition or they voted for the government party, that is, that's not the place of the police to go and choose and pick. <coughs> all Kenyans, irrespective of how they voted, are taxpayers. They are entitled by right to protection under the law 
by our security agencies. And they have it very clear. I have told them, I have called the uh, um, provincial administration, the national government uh, administration officers, from the regional commissioner to the county commissioner, and I have told them it is not in their place to play politics. Yeah. His Excellency, are they you aware? They must respect every elected leader, whether they are elected and work with every elected leader, whether they are elected on the government side or on the opposition side, an elected leader is an elected leader. And I have told them to support government activity, government programs, that is their business, to make sure their IDs are issued, all the other government services are delivered in all areas, irrespective of who voted in which place. I have also told them they must support government, uh, county government uh, uh, functions and programs. Mm -hmm. Because a government is a government, whether it is run by a person in the opposition party or a person in the governing party, it is a government at that level. And the provincial administration at that level must support government activity, where national and county, because that is how we are going to grow Kenya. Government functions, government programs that support the people of Kenya must be supported by all government uh, people. Mr. So, President, are you aware that uh, we have about 750,000 pistols and rifles in private hands, of course, more than the police and military combined? And of course, this is according to a survey, a Geneva-based small arms survey. And the biggest worry, and of course what it is that experts then dictate, is that sheer volume of guns is a national security concern. If everybody were to go out and protect themselves, the, parade, uh, the police within the law, the people, Kenyans who seem to have lost faith in the aspect of uh, security, that's why they'll go around you know, in search of guns and all that, some of them are licensed. What would it mean? Uh, for your information, uh, Linda, we... We have the reason why we have a government is that is that so that we can delegate some the functions to some people, yeah. Otherwise, if 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 it becomes everybody for himself, you know, then we stop being a nation and we stop being a state, you know, and we just become something else, mm -hmm. right? So um, small arms is a big challenge. Uh, correctly. Not, not in Kenya, in our region, you know, and, and the use of proliferation of illegal firearms in the wrong hands is part of the challenge we are facing with even the cattle rustlers, the terrorists, and all these other criminal. Uh, and that is why I said earlier in, our, in, in, the, in the Kiswahili interview that we have purposed ourselves. And the peer, the, 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 the CS, Professor Kendiki, his uh, peers, uh, Mr. Omolo, are properly guided on what we should do as government to rein in on these runaway cooks and ensure that we deal with them decisively. We have made huge strides. As I told you, I was in Baringo in December, and they were saying for the last seven months we have slept, you know. But let me also tell you, that it is not over until it is over. Mm -hmm. So we will keep upping our game. There is need for us to uh, upgrade some of the equipments we are using. There is need to enhance our mobility for our security forces. It boils down to the budget, you know? Mm -hmm. And that is why I am really focused on sorting out the economy because that way we will have the resources to sort out our roads, to mm -hmm. sort out our security, <coughs> and to sort out the things that are dear. C.S. Kindiki okay. Kiture uh, says, and I quote, we cannot afford to have a country where citizens live in constant fear and we will not spare any effort, even if it means using the KDF. The constitution dictates that the KDF are then released only as a last resort, and of course to restore peace, but with approval of the National Assembly. Article 241.3c of the Constitution. Is the banditry menace as bad and severe such that the government would consider KDF? It is serious, but it hasn't reached the threshold for us to 
go to parliament to get the idea of involved. We, however, are sharing information, you know, from intelligence from all sides. We are sharing uh, facilities and resources, you know. Um, and in some of the uh, areas, we are, we are making the decision that it's good to have security installations in some of these areas. Like, for example, in that whole North Rift, we're going to have some of the training facilities for our security agencies to cement government uh, presence in some of those areas and to make sure that whenever we need to deploy, we are not deploying from afar. So there will be, for example, a garrison being built up by the army in Lodwa. There will be another garrison uh, that will be built in, uh, in the Suguta Valley mm -hmm. to make sure that people feel, you know, because security is also presence, you know, real presence. So we are deploying, <coughs> sorry, all manner of uh, um, interventions and strategies to make sure that we manage our security. As, Why don't we have a commission uh, <coughs> that, uh, of course, a commission of inquiry that then would look into the extrajudicial killings now that you mentioned the Rivayala cases and as well the involvement of Ipoa and Imus and all that. I already had a thorough meeting with the uh, Ipoa and we have agreed with them that it is not necessary for me to establish another task force when Ipoa is there and it is squarely within their mandate to tell us how did Kenyans end up being killed in this manner. And then it was business as usual. 30 bodies in Yala, the 17 bodies in Garissa. I don't know how many bodies were. You know, people, you know, we, we, there, there, was a, there was a container here at the, at, at the Nairobi area. People were being slaughtered in a police station. How did we end up there? You know, what, what kind of what kind of rogue, you know, institution? And that is why I fired that Kenoti man, you know, because, I mean, it's, it's not right, good people. Should there be responsibility more than just firing? Of course, there will be responsibility. He did not resign? You fired him? <laughs> mm -hmm. We'll have another. <laughs> okay, can, 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 can we move this forward, Your Excellency? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, since we're talking about uh, security and talk about we have involved in DR Congo, we have interest in Somalia, What's our game plan? What exactly are we doing in this? <coughs> uh, smart. We, uh, as a country, and uh, maybe many Kenyans have been wondering, uh, I have been to DRC, I have been to uh, um, Uganda, I have been to uh, Ethiopia, I was in um, South Sudan. Y you know, Kenya has the largest economy in this region. And we have huge in interest in the stability of this region. If this region is unstable, the biggest hit will be on our economy. Apart from that, we need to pacify this region so that we can, the East African community can become a real market for our products. We are having a big conversation about Dongokundu, mm -hmm. about uh, Naivasha uh, Industrial City, about uh, our manufacturing, about all the other facilities that we are working on. Those products have to be exported somewhere. We are looking at how do we grow our agriculture, agro-processing, our tea, our coffee. Where are we selling these products? We have to be interested in creating that market. And that market has to be in a peaceful place. So the reason why we have an interest as a nation, and I am actively you know, driving the, the stability of this region. I, I spoke uh, on, on, not yesterday, the day before yesterday, with the president of, uh, of, of Sudan, and agreed with him that it is time to have an eager meeting for us to help our brothers and sisters in South Sudan. I spoke on first with the president of uh, uh, Ethiopia on the, what we are doing as a country to support them with what is going on in Tigray. I am in constant uh, conversation with the president of DRC. We have soldiers in DRC 
who are supporting the stabilization of that region. Uganda has soldiers, South Sudan has soldiers, Burundi has soldiers to pacify the region. So regional peace is a very important component of our economy. But highly pegged on the political situation, the transitions that we, uh, we witness, and such has not been guaranteed to the people in terms of the electoral processes. Perhaps that's the reason why we celebrate uh, our previous election. <coughs> Just what will be done to make sure that even the political transitions <coughs> then are properly done to guarantee us a regional peace? Precisely, you know, you don't wait until you have a problem. You, you manage the situation ahead of time. So we are, what, whatever we are doing, whether it is in DRC, whether it is in the rest of the region, is to make sure that we are not taken by surprise by anything. Okay. You know, that we are mobilizing the region and we are mobilizing international support also for our regional uh, peace initiatives to make sure that Kenya contributes, you know, our, you know, uh, our bit in making sure that our region is stable so that we can drive our economy, we can drive trade, we can drive investment, and we can support and, and build our economy. Okay, our one word on the Somali and, uh, of course, our very own uh, spillover. Somalia is a very interesting situation, and uh, we, we now have a leadership in Somalia that are working with us. And we're not only working with the president of Somalia, we are very happy that he is now consolidating even with the regional uh, presidents in Somalia so that we jointly attack the Al-Shabaab menace. <coughs> we are very happy that at least we have some synergy and agreement. And we have uh, taken the position that Somalia is a problem for Somalia as it is a problem for us. We cannot afford to look away. We cannot afford to walk away. We have to deal with that challenge because if we don't, it will get to our doorsteps. We are lucky that we are keeping it at bay because of our intervention. Otherwise, it will ride all the way to you nowhere. Mr. President, allow me to bring you back home and discuss another topic matter that is of importance. Thank you. Um, as soon as you were elected president, <coughs> there was a phenomenon that happened. The cases were collapsing left and center. And these cases were of corruption in nature, and then other coincidence happened. Once you nominated um, some people, their case was also withdrawn. I don't know what you feel about that and what you have to say about that. You know, when we talked about this, it looked like it was politics, you know? There was a huge push by the former administration, our friends, you know, to use the criminal justice system to run their politics, you know? And, and to fabricate, you know, cases against people merely because they didn't agree with your political side. You, it, is, it is in the public domain, my brother. Many governors, they were called, yeah, we are going to do this, 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 we are going to start a file, you must be in Azimio. You, uh, you must be in Azimio. You must. The reason why Azimio is definitely going to collapse is because it was built on quicksand. It was built on threats, blackmail, intimidation. So, <laughs> to, to, to answer your question, is if the criminal justice system was used, today, the people who are supposed to give evidence against these people are saying, we can't give evidence because we were forced to say this and this and this as against this person because it was, uh, we, we, were, we, were, we were forced to say so. Otherwise, our jobs were going to be on the, on the line. So, I mean, so how do you support such a case? What, what, what are, are we supposed to say, prosecute this person anyway? You know? So, I, and it is not for me, by the way. It's not for me to decide. There is no single case I have been asked. And for your information, I have told cabinet here. I have told my cabinet ministers. I have told the DPP, I have told the ESCC director, I have told the DCI, normally before somebody is arrested who is working in government, the president is informed, <coughs> you know, so that he can uh, say something. I have told them, don't call me. Okay. 
I read the Constitution, read the law. If somebody needs to be prosecuted, whether he is minister, whether he is PS, whether he is whoever, I will ask a follow-up question. I don't want to be asked anything. I ask and I have told the criminal justice system. I have told my sister, the, 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 the chief justice and president of the Supreme Court, I will never call her to ask her for any favor on any case. The only conversation maybe I will ask her is, if a case is taking too long, is to ask her, please expedite. We are not telling you rule this way or rule this way. Okay, Mr. Expedite the case, rule in whatever way, so that we know whether we are going left or we are going right. Mr. President, I accept your premise that these cases were politically motivated, as you've said. Why isn't the DPP being asked to take foundational responsibility? Because that office took cases. There are, um, there are things I cannot uh, speak on on, 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 national, uh, on national television for other reasons, yeah? But uh, if, if I told you, for example, that uh, Already the DPP had uh, been asked to hand in his resignation. You know, if he it, if it, if it doesn't prosecute this case and this case and this case, you know? I mean, it was just an ugly situation. And I pray that Kenya never again goes to a place where the criminal justice system is used to manipulate politics. So the problem, we must never be there. Yeah, I just want to, to ask this before I allow my, my colleagues to get into this. The question that you bring us now to the public is, we have to trust you that you're not using that same office for political expediency. That is what you are forcing us to do. As a country, because if, we don't know the details. And, and, if, and if there are signs that my office is being, it should be called out. That, that's why I am an open book. That's why I want a vibrant, Opposition. How did how we got here because of the handshake nonsense? Uh, my good brother, Buana <laughs> Smart. We got here because you get the opposition, which is supposed to hold government to account, into some illegal, you know, cohabitation, or whatever it was called. You know, in the name of unity. What, what unity? You know, who says by having an opposition, we are not united? So, Kenyans voted in this election, right? There are as many people in uh, Azimio as there are in, in, uh, in Kenya Kwanzaa. So, are you going to fault Kenyans that they caused disunity? The Kenyans, Kenyans voted. Mr. President. So it is now up to us leaders to figure out this is the decision of Kenyans. Sorry. Kenyans have said, you guys go and run government. They have said, you guys go and mm -hmm. check government. Okay. Let us appropriate one, our responsibilities to end the Yes, just as one final question on this, <laughs> uh, because we, we have to clear this up. And let me say it looking at Kenyans. Yeah. That's your camera. The office of the president will not be used okay. to use the criminal justice system against my opponents, any political purpose. So the guarantee here. And that I, 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 I can sign off as William Ruto. It mm -hmm. will not happen. The guarantee here. I, I, you know, I have enough people uh, to help me do politics. You know, I have uh, first myself. You know, I am a politician. I know what to do with politics, right? I don't need the police. I don't need the criminal justice system. You know, I can go and speak to Kenyans. The way I spoke to Kenyans, you know, Persuade them, sell them my view. They have my track record. They they know what they want. They they know. And for your information, uh, just allow me to say this, please. Why you find that uh, the people of Kenya are really energized, asking, you know, about things about my administration? Is because the people of Kenya know me, and they know what I am capable of doing. And they judge me by very high standards. You know, if it was just another guy, 
they wouldn't mind if he did one or two things, right? Because okay. they would say, okay, maybe this guy anyway has tried. Yes, but for me, I have to do things at another level because they, 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 know, they, they, know, they know what I'm capable of doing. Yeah, I think the reasons that we're asking this and, and to, to finish this sequence of questioning on the rule of law and accountability is you actually put in the Kenya Kwanzaa Manifesto and you said yourself that you'll establish within 30 days a quasi-judicial public inquiry to establish the extent of chronism, state capture, and such things. It's well past 30 days. It is, it is well past 30 days. Um, when you come in uh, the space where we came in, you know, the events of uh, August 15th, mm -hmm, were, were horrible, you know? Because even the, the military institution had been roped into the scheme to sabotage the will of the people of Kenya because of that state capture menace, right? If Chebukati were to tell you the kind of hell Yeah. If the, the day the story of August 15th will be told in, uh, in Kenya, you will know why I am delaying. Yeah. Because now I have to <coughs> balance between the economy. You know, we are almost in the red. You know. Or do I swing this big thing that will drain our energy? I want to promise you that that story will be told one day. This state capture will be done one day. But you will establish the commission? We will establish the commission one day. But where we are as a country, I have to balance. You know, if you were to sit where, where I'm sitting, uh, <laughs> James, yeah? you would know why I have to go slow on certain things to allow the country to get out of the mess we are in, you know, uh, we, without overloading it with so many, you know, so many, other, so many other issues. Our plate is full, you know, so, <laughs> so I, have to, I have to kind of balance, you know, but I want to promise you that that story so, okay. Uh, Mr. President. Yes, sir. Um, <laughs> the political system that we are in, uh, I mean, straight after your cabinet, what is the coincidence that I'll just mention three names? Your own deputy, Rigadi Gashagwa. In fact, he's getting his 200 million shillings back. Aisha Jumo, your cabinet secretary, and Mithika Linturi, your cabinet secretary. These were cases, not one. Some had multiple cases in court. You want to tell us that you didn't have a hand in their clearance and the stalling of those cases? Let me look again at the people of Kenya. William Ruto, the president of Kenya, had nothing to do with the cases that were dropped by the DPP against not just the three, any other case. Okay. And you can sit with uh, my good brother, uh, Nurdin, and ask him directly whether he has received a call from me to tell him drop this case or drop that case. Do you think it's just natural, Mr. President, that uh, Rigadi Gashagwa, who was just uh, the other day a member of parliament, is now the deputy president, and his cases are falling? Mm. And obviously Kenyans will suspect there's a hand of the president <laughs> and the government of the day. <laughs> Let the, also Kenyans uh, can. Also Kenyans know that the criminal justice system was mobilized okay. by the former administration to achieve political ends. Okay. Otherwise, for your information, with all these cases, how did we get ourselves selected? I mean, if, if, if all this was true, are you telling me seven million plus Kenyans who said no, these people are the right people to lead our country? Are, are you telling me the, 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 our, our election was done uh, at night. 
How different or, or, is the or, or, in, or in a dark place. Uh, from you what know, you said. What, what, I am t what I am telling you is yes. the people of Kenya can, can decipher between what is right and what is wrong. Okay. Right? What is right, what is wrong, and what is right. And if uh, my good uh, friend, uh, Rigathi Gashagwa, had anything to do with, uh, with, 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 with that matter, these people would have jailed him long time ago. Okay. I'll talk about your deputy, but tell me, um, from what you have said based on Jim Smart's questions, you support a very strong political system. Yes, you I want do. the opposition to sit on their side. You want to do your work. And if you do this, why is it that uh, political parties are complaining that they haven't received their funding? If you really intended on supporting these political systems, mm. why can the political parties, which you political party that brought you to office, is one of the biggest, I believe it's all also affected, but the other smaller parties are complaining, first quarter, second quarter, third quarter, of the funding in the offices. This is a sabotage. <laughs> you don't want them to grow, yet you support a strong political system. <laughs> so it is sabotage, says who, and, the by, political party and, and by who? Political parties that yes. are saying they haven't received the first quarter, yes. second quarter, and third quarter. Have, have they also told you that even my own party has not received any funding? You're the ruling party. Yes, even the ruling party has not received You're the ruling party. Perhaps you have funding. Then they're from, outside from, the government. From where? Survive. Let me tell you, yes. uh, Ken. Eh? I am a very big believer in building political parties as institutions of governance. In fact, a country, a democracy, a government is as good as its political party or political system. You know? It is the way we are going to detribalize our politics, is to build political parties strong, credible, uh, issue-founded uh, uh, political parties. Th that's, that's, uh, that's what we should do, right? And on this, I have said not once, not many, not, 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 uh, not, not, not once, not twice. On this, I have said, you must give credit to my former party called ODM. We started ODM together with others, yeah? At least they have gone, you know, they, they've existed for long enough. Unfortunately for me, Jubilee, which was my party, was destroyed, you know, by characters there. So what I am a strong believer of um, parties as institutions of governance. And that there will be adequate resources always for the political, for political parties. Okay. The challenge that we have is money was provided. It was sent to the, uh, to the uh, uh, ORPP, you know. <coughs> but the challenge is some parties went to court to quarrel about the amounts. Mm -hmm. Surely, okay. as somebody who respects the rule of law, do you want me to go and override Okay. You know? how, how, how does this? <laughs> so, the same way I am waiting, the court have taken, they, the people have gone to court, I cannot appoint CSS, CASS, I am waiting. So, those ones are also waiting, okay. people have gone to court. When the court decides, because we all respect the, the court, we will, we will, we will You're, you're excellent. Yes. Uh, you have been elected for the first five-year term. I want to bring in an aspect of your election that perhaps would be of interest. There's something that happens in this country, political patronage. Already we have seen conversations uh, going on in your own party, for example, with Nairobi County, and I know my colleagues will talk about it, where uh, Johnson Sakaja is actually put on the chopping board. We supported you in this election. You have to do a bidding. But my question is, based on some of the proposals in the past, for example, the BBI proposed seven-year term, straight after your, uh, your swearing in, there was an outrageous proposal on um, removing mm -hmm. the town limit, mm -hmm. which you rejected mm -hmm. as soon as it was mentioned. But my question is, would you... Now that you sit on that seat, would you propose, for example, that what was being mooted then, a seven-year term, for example, an amendment of the Constitution, a single term for the president, ends this patronage so that you are not heavily burdened by the next election in 2027? So, you know, I have a seven-year term, one term, I'm gone. Would you say that would be important to end this culture of political patronage? I don't have the monopoly of making proposals. 
for changing the constitution. I have made mine. Why don't you make yours, <laughs> including even that one? <laughs> That's OK. There's no problem. We, let us all, because the constitution is not about a person. Isn't your one of yeah. So even Ken, <laughs> that, that suggestion you are making, you can make, or others can make whatever they want, uh, whatever suggestions they, they, they want. It will be assessed on its own merit. It will be processed by the, you know, the structure provided by the constitution, either as a parliamentary initiative or as a uh, citizen initiative, whatever. So there are many proposals that can be considered. I have made the ones that I think, for me, from where I sit, my desk, I want the issue of two that gender sorted out for two reasons. Number one, I made a commitment to women of the Republic of Kenya. And number two, I found a challenge on the desk left by Uhuru Kenyatta on dissolution of parliament on account of failure to have two that. I have an interest at, from where I sit as president. I have an interest in accountability. That's why I'm proposing that let us have ministers go to parliament to answer questions. I have an interest in accountability. That's why I want the leader of an office be created of the leader of the opposition so that my challenger mm -hmm. is not left addressing people in funerals. At least he has an office and a bureaucracy <laughs> to Mr. support him. Uh, no, Mr. President, Mr. President I, 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 have I, to, I, I have to ask this question. No, no, I'm just saying uh, yes. we create a forum, yeah. you know, a respectable forum for the alternative government, you know, to, to also function, you know, so to keep government to on. Okay, on, Mr. President, we should okay. And I'm telling you, yes. when I talk about creating an office, I am not talking about creating a job for a person. Okay, Mr. President. I am talking about creating an institution that will outlive all of us and support the delivery of government uh, services by keeping the executive on check. But, but are you captured as a politician with patronage? Are you <coughs> captured or it's okay? It's a phenomenon that is accepted. Let me tell you. Yes. Politics world over is about interests. You know, politics is about interests. So they, they, you can never have politics that don't have interests. Even the reason people vote for me is because they have an interest. Mutu wana time, he asked Lafand, nitapata hapa. Hapa, nitapata mambo yangu ya ile universal. So people vote for, for, for interest. And for the case you mentioned about uh, Nairobi and yes, what have you, yes. that's, a, that's a, a, a political challenge we have okay. as a party. You know, we will sit down as a party and sort it out. Okay. You know, we have the acumen to do it. You know, we have a new governor in Nairobi. There are issues. He's trying to do this. He's trying to do that. Some he gets right. Some maybe he needs a bit more consultation, something like that. And that's why I am there. You're micromanaging. You know, I will, no, no, no. We will, support, uh, we will support all our governors. Some of them are making the right decisions. Some of them are not. We, we, we just managed to, you know, do something about Meru. In fact, as I talk to you now, there is a conversation with Meru leaders, which my, my deputy is going on with, to make sure that we support them politically because the governor has, does not have so much experience in managing... So you need to manage that. So we have to help. You Mr. Know. Mr. President, I understand yeah. that we are out of time. Yeah. Okay. Um, I need to hand over to our lead moderator, but we've oh. been here for, I think, over two and, and so hours. Yes. Uh, I haven't seen the office of the first daughter. <laughs> You'd finish that as you take us home. <laughs> where, where is that office situated? Uh, Leave my daughter Shalene alone. <laughs> no, these are kids, you know. <laughs> they, are, they are just, you know, they are just being children. Okay. You know? So you know very well, uh, James, that there is no such office. No, you know, this is a girl who is just being a, a herself, a child. Mm -hmm. You know, she has this space with uh, her colleagues. You know, her colleagues are pushing her. Oh, you know, maybe we could do this. Maybe we could do this. But uh, you know, she <laughs> she's okay. You okay. know, she's just tapping being, into the privilege. She's just being the daughter of William Ruto, and sometimes <laughs> she doesn't know the divide between the <laughs> and the father. So, you know. uh, all, right, all right, Mr. President, we have less than a minute, and let's yeah. use that to look at. Uh, you promised that uh, there would be 50-50 gender uh, representation in cabinet. You have uh, 15 male CSs, seven female CSs. You have 39 male PSs, and 12 female PSs. What happened? I, 
I, I, I, I could have done better. But you know, as I told you, policy is about balancing many things. You're balancing regions, you're balancing age, you're balancing this, that, the other. And you know, it, there was even a very interesting uh, scenario. One of the female governors called me and told me that, uh, please, uh, please uh, uh, make so-and-so uh, peers. And of course, he was pushing for a male person. So I told her, Governor, I already have problems, you know, with the women. Instead of you pushing me to appoint more men, why should you should be pushing me to appoint some, some more women? So that is why part of the reason why I have appointed a gender uh, advisor in my office, because I intend to pursue this thing beyond the appointments I have made in cabinet and uh, in PSS. Mm -hmm. I, I am pushing the agenda of two-third gender, uh, two gender rule so, so that we can sort out and expand the space of women beyond the appointments we are making okay. so that we can create that much more room. Mr. President, thank you so much for your time. And thank you, the viewer, for supporting us with sharing some of the questions. And uh, Mr. President, there's been a lot of interest on this. Uh, some negative, some positive, but I think <laughs> it is the work of the president. I am used to that space. <laughs> so thank you very much, Sam, and your team, yeah, yeah for uh, also finding time for us to have this conversation. And thank you very much, uh, the great people of Kenya, for listening to us. My assurance is that uh, we will not drop the ball, okay. and we will make sure that we discharge on our commitments. All right. Uh, from the rest of us, it's, it's good night. My name is Sam Gitoko from Citizen TV. Bye for now.